Okay, good afternoon. This is gonna be our first listening lab for the medieval and Renaissance. Um, I'm gonna be pausing here and there to avoid the ads, or at least do my best to avoid the ads. So first thing we need to do is get comfortable logging in to Music First. First thing we're gonna do is we're going to come to the Ridgeview Classical Schools website. We're gonna go over to Quick Links, and we're gonna scroll down to Music First. Click Music First. That should take us to the Music First portal, assuming the internet is gonna work. Okay, it's working, it's thinking. All right, accept all cookies. Now, um, I have a slightly different username and password. Your username is, is most likely in 99% of cases is gonna be your first initial last name. If you have a hyphenated last name or a brother or sister that has an identical first initial last name, like a twin or something, then your yours might be a little different and you'll already know that. Everyone's password is lowercase RCS music as in Ridgeview Classical Schools, RCS Music, all lowercase. Then you click the red login. Now, on mine, you're going to see all kinds of classes because uh, I have access to everything. So, uh, but in yours, you're probably just gonna see one or two classes. What you're looking for is Core 6 Music, all sections, 2020, 2021. That's your class. So you'll have less boxes and you just click that one. All right. Next, you are looking for class calendar. That's your friend. And then we're gonna go over to our first week, syllabus and assignment week one. Now this syllabus and assignment is also located in your course packet. So you'll see all the things here. We have a reading guide. I'll have links to the reading guide and listening labs once they're completed. And then we have introduction to music first, music first pretest. And we have some basic rhythm and melody things. And then we have our reading review, which we're doing. And here's where the listening lab comes in. So we have two links. We have a Gregorian chant, Puer Natus Es Nobis, and we have Siku Cervus. So here's where I'm gonna click the link, but I'm gonna pause just to see if I can avoid these ads. So we're gonna pause and I will be right back. Okay, computer's being a little more laggy than I would like, but I think we're gonna be okay. So this is Puer Natus Es Nobis. Notice it's in Latin. Um, so Latin is the language of the church. And so most of our music, our sacred music is in Latin until much later. Secular music might be in a different language uh, than Latin. So this is the one of the intro chants for Christmas Day, one of the more famous ones. And as we're listening, listen to the fact that it's men singing, all the same line, monophonic, and look at the different symbols. They kind of look like our, our musical notes, but remember these are called nooms, and they, uh, they work essentially like our music notes, but they just look a little funny. Okay, here we go.
that is the what we call the antiphon. Some of these words I'm not going to make you memorize or anything like that. But so it's like the A section, the first section. And you'll notice you hear a group of men uh, singing all together, and they're singing in this kind of very calm, meditative way. Uh, some people actually use this music for meditation, um, but of course, it was originally designed to be uh, part of a church mass. So now you'll see here we have this PS, and PS is short for Psalm. So this is something that comes from the Bible. Uh, this is, and we see in the music here, this double bar. And that double bar tells us, just like a new paragraph, like indenting a paragraph, it tells us that there's a new section. And you'll notice that the, the style of chant changes a little bit, becomes maybe a little bit more simple. So this is the psalm verse, the second section of the chant. <laughs> stops there, what would actually happen at that point is that it would go back to the very beginning. And so what we have is a rounded complete form that's ABA. -A. So we have one section, a, a contrasting section, and then it goes back to the beginning, which is still very common today. Okay, um, so I'm going to pause briefly and then we will add just a little bit more to our notes. Okay, now that we've got our medieval notes back up, uh, this, these were, if you haven't seen any of this before, this is um, from our reading guide. So make sure you've done that first. Um, so we have our musical notes, our noom, and Gregorian chant is, one thing I wanted to add here, it's in Latin, right? Which is the language of the church. Okay, and I think that's sung by men in Latin. Okay, all right. Might want to add the medieval period is fall of Rome to 1450. Okay, next we're going to be switching gears and we're going to do the Renaissance now. So. I will be right back with the Renaissance piece. Okay. So this is going to be a lot more involved in terms of the analysis of the music than that simple Gregorian chant. So we're going to listen to it first, and then I'm going to sort of explain how pretty much all Renaissance music works. So we're going to look at this piece, Siku Cervus by Palestrina. And this uh, song, which is called a motet, um, which just means sacred song, is sort of the, the poster child for Renaissance music. So by studying this one piece, we'll kind of understand how all Renaissance music works. So here we go, we'll give it a listen and then we'll analyze it briefly. Thank you. 
So a uh, beautiful piece of music, obviously very complex, but um, once I show you how it really works, you'll be able to listen to it a little bit better and you'll also be able to um, understand how it, how it works. So let me just put here, Siku Cervus Analysis. So Renaissance polyphony, and again, we know what the Renaissance is and we know what polyphony is, right? That's the many voices. And you can tell in Siku Cervus, each voice is kind of doing its own melody. Well, this is the formula and I'll, I'll write it and then we can talk about it a little bit. So you have a head motive and then that head motive is imitated in the other voices, usually all four voices. And then we have the, what's called the drive to the cadence. And again, I know you don't know what any of these words mean yet, but then you will. And then cadence, okay? So let's, let's add some things to our terms list. Again, this doesn't need to be overwhelming. It'll all make sense once I explain it. So we have head motive. What else did I say? Imitation. We kind of already know what imitation is. That's not really a special thing. Drive to the cadence and then cadence. So let's talk about what each of these things is. This is, so head motive is a melodic idea. That's it. Imitation is just like any kind of imitation. It is taking the, it's the head motive being, well, let's say passed around to the other voices. Drive to the cadence means as we get closer to the cadence, uh, more excitement. I'm just trying to give you some simple definitions here. And cadence is like a musical period, the end of the musical idea. So you can see this, it pretty much explains this little equation, this little formula, pretty much explains how almost all music of the Renaissance was created. So again, head motive, then imitation, drive to the cadence, and then the cadence, okay? And this cadence is this feeling of completion, of, of something being completed, finished, final. All right, so let's hop back to Siku Cherubus. And now we're gonna analyze this a little bit further. Let's see if I can get it to, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna stop a couple times and, and we can kind of journey through the piece together here. So we see very clearly in the score, the head motive. In this case, the head motive is in very long notes. We have whole notes and half notes, and then some quarter notes. This is the head motive here. That little melodic idea is the head motive. And let's just take the first, so we know based on our Renaissance formula, that we should hear that in all four voices. Now the alto. Now the soprano. Now the bass. Now at this point, all four voices have entered with the head motive. And then we have different melodies happening from each of the other voices. And those are gonna be different. That's part of the polyphony word, many different melodies. So then you can see they're not all doing the same thing, but one of the voices will come back in. So now we see the tenor come back in with those long C coots, right? Okay, so see it while you're listening, you know, enjoy the, the texture of all the other voices, but see if you can focus on, excuse me, focus on the 
the long note head motive. Alto. back a little bit. Now think about the beginning of the piece. It was like a whole note and a couple half notes. Not much going on. Now look here. Look at all. We have eighth notes now. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing and it feels very full when we, it sounds very full when we listen to it. And that's because this is that drive to the cadence I was talking about. There's a lot of activity, a lot of excitement before the end of the idea. And the end of end of the idea is about to happen when the the page turns. So let's let's jump back a little bit. And you can kind of hear where it kind of settles down, and then a new idea starts. <laughs> so at this point, right here, where it says room, that's where our period is. That's where the cadence occurs, and you'll see it almost starts to look like the very beginning of the piece again. The soprano has stopped singing, the tenor stops singing for a while, the bass stops singing, and we just get a little bit of activity here in the alto. The new idea is this. So you're listening. Now, instead of sikut, we have a new head motive on the word ita. So now look at your etas and see how they work. So remember, sikut was ascending. Sikut cherus, ita is going down. Ita de, right? So it's just a little bit of simple variety. We didn't have so much of a cadence, but now we get another new head motive, this anima mea. So it goes a little higher and then comes down. So now you can be listening for etas and animas. So the, the texture is getting a little bit more complicated, but works the same way. So we have new head motives. <laughs> This is right before the end of the piece. Look at all the activity. This is that drive to the cadence. Everyone's kind of doing their own thing. Look at the rhythms. Nothing really lines up. And that again, that's that excitement and intensity before we kind of relax into the cadence. <laughs> Thank you.
And again, we see that the soprano isn't doing anything, right? Just holding that single note for a very, very long time. So that's not any activity. So again, we see this is kind of the winding down of the piece. And then again, we see just like the beginning, everyone beginning and ending on whole notes to kind of cap encapsulate the piece and make it sort of restful at the end. So again, going back to our notes, this is simply expressed here head motive, that first musical idea, then it gets imitated in the other voices, then as we get closer to the end of the musical sentence, the cadence, it kind of gets more excited, and then we have a cadence. And that's pretty much how all music of this time period operates. Okay, so hopefully you, your notes are looking like mine, and we've got our terms list being built, and again, uh, this isn't a super long list, and many of these things you might already sort of know about, like soprano, alto, tenor, bass, or acapella, you might have heard some of these things. So hopefully not all of this is brand new to you. All right, well, that concludes our first listening lab. I hope this was helpful for you, and we will see you next time.